So in the Caesar cipher program, we originally used the string replace method. This time we're going to use a for loop. Now before I go right into it, I thought it would be a good idea to go over a few things just to review, as well as introduce a few new concepts before actually using them. There's quite a few new things in this program that we haven't really built a real program with yet, and so I thought this could be beneficial. Just to try to avoid some confusion so you feel hopefully a little less confused as you're going through the next video. So in the previous version, we used the string replace method, which is what we also used when we did Morse code. In fact, we just took the Morse code program and converted it for a Caesar cipher. So basically, the way it worked is we had the string, which you can see here, which I just rewrote here, and we ran the string.lower method, which you can see right there. So the name of the variable, dot lower. And so after that, we had all the string replace methods that basically they hunt through the string line by line, looking for that very specific character. So basically the way it looks as it's processing is that first line, we take this right here, it converts it to lower, so only the T and the S were modified. Now it actually runs the whole thing through lower, but it only affected these because the rest were lower already, with exception to punctuation space, which there's no lower version. So essentially, that's the difference we saw. Now we have the string written in just lower. The next line it said to replace A for C. Well, now I chose a lowercase a and a capital C, so that way what it would do is when we get down to C, by following the same pattern, it's not going to replace these capital C's with the next letter because a capital and lowercase are different in programming. So it looks through the string, finds the A, so here's an A, there's an A, there's an A, and they line up sort of-ish with the string above, and then it turns them into capital C's. So now we have this for the string. It runs that new string, this new string here, and it replaces any B's that it finds for a capital D. There is not a single B in the string, so there's no change. But it still ran the process anyways because I told it to. Then it looks for any lowercase c's. Notice the capitals are not shown here because it's not the same. So it replaces this lowercase c with a capital E. And then we have it looking for lowercase d's and lowercase e's and so on. And so eventually this will become what appears to be gibberish. Now, for the loop method, instead of hunting through that string for a specific letter over and over and over again, instead what this is going to do is it's going to change one letter at a time. It's going to change the very first letter, then the second letter, then the third, and etc. It's not going to look for a certain letter, it's just going to change it no matter what the current letter is, and it doesn't matter what the letter was before it. Once again, just for simplicity, we're going to convert to lower. We don't have to in this method, but it will make the program shorter. You could always use if and else statements and whatnot to use both, but to keep the next video shorter, I chose to convert to dot lower. So now that the whole thing is lower, what it's going to do is it's going to go through for each letter of the string. It's going to add the shift value to it, and then it's going to add that to a variable that we're going to call encrypted string or encrypted message or something like that. Now to do this, if you remember earlier on, you can't add an integer and a string. Now we could put that integer inside of like quotes, right, so then it's a string, but then the problem is it's no longer actually a number, it's just the character that represents that number. And we can't convert the letters to numbers because they're not numbers. So what we have to do is we have to use an actual specific function that will do that for us. We have ard and we have char. So ord will convert letters to integers and char will convert integers back into letters. Now it's not like the number a, it actually converts it to a number that represents a that can then be converted back. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take ord of a letter, which makes it an integer, then we're going to add the shift value to it, and then we're going to convert it back into a letter, and then it'll work. 
So when we're using the for loop, we'll start with the t. It's going to add 2 to it. And then it's going to add that to the encrypted string. So the way it works, basically, is we do ORD of t, which will make it into a number, which we can then add 2 to. And then we take the char of that new value, and that becomes a v. For the next letter, r, once again, ORD of r plus 2, we'll get an integer. And then we'll take the char of that, and that will become t. And we'll go to a which will spit out a C, and G to I, E to G, and so on. Now it isn't quite this simple, there's a few other things that we have to do, but this is it, just basically speaking. So we go from a flow of program that looks like this for the string.replace method, where basically we define the string at the start, then we replace A, then we replace B, all the way down to Z, and then we print the result to instead something that looks like this. It looks more confusing, but it works better. And we'll talk about why later. So it starts, it defines the string, then for each character it will convert it to a number, add the shift, convert it back to a character, and then move to the next character. And it'll keep doing this until it's out of characters. Once it reaches the end of the string, it will print the result, and the program will end. Now there's one other thing that we need to talk about, and that's modulo. Now, modulo isn't really a hard concept, but it's not what we're used to doing when we think of math. Modulo is defined as the remainder of one number divided by another, and that sounds confusing, but it's really not. If you think about division, and you think like 4 divided by 2, you know, the answer is 2, there's no remainder, right? And we're used to doing that process. We're used to doing 4 divided by 2 equals 2, and then we check for a remainder. Modulo basically skips that middle step. It doesn't care what 4 divided by 2 is. It only cares if there is a remainder. So it kind of cuts out that middle step there, and it's just checking for the remainder. So let's see it in action a little bit. So if we do 9 mod 3 that becomes 0 because 9 divided by 3 is 3, there's nothing left over. If instead we do 9 mod 2, that ends up equaling 1 because 9 divided by 2 is 4, we have 1 left over because 4 times 2 is only 8, right? So 9 mod 2 is 1. If we do 9 mod 1, that equals 0 because, well, because any number divided by 1 is itself there will be no remainder left over. Nine ones fit into nine, so nothing's left over. And then lastly, if we do nine mod zero, we're going to get an error. Just like you can't divide by zero, you can't mod by zero either. So to look at it with a different value, if we did 25 mod one, we would end up with zero, because once again, any number divided by one is going to be itself, because that's how many of that value, that's how many ones will fit into it. If we do 25 mod 2, we'll end up with 1, because 12 and 12 is 24, we have 1 left over. If we do 25 mod 3, we end up with 1, because 3 times 8 is 24, we have 1 left over. And if we do 25 divided by 4, we end up with 1 also, because 6 times 4 is 24, and we have 1 left over. And lastly, 25 mod 5 would be 0 because 5 times 5 is 25. So that's how it works. It's just, it's just doing that division and just checking is there a remainder. We can do it with larger values too. So if we do 25 mod 25, we end up with 0 because 1 25 fits into 25. If we do 26 mod 25, we end up with 1 because that's how much we have left over. 30 mod 25 equals 5 we have 5 left over. 49 mod 25 is 24. 50 mod 25 is 0. And I chose to do this larger value because this is what it's going to sort of look like in our Caesar Cipher program. Now you might be saying, like, what are we going to use this for? And I know I haven't said what yet, but we'll get to that. For right now, it's just important that you understand how modulo works. And remember, it's just looking for that remainder. It doesn't care 
what the actual result is of the division, only if there's a remainder left over at the ends. And that's what you're going to have it spit out. In Python, for modulo, we use the percentage line, but that's not always the case. Uh, in some languages, they actually write mod. Uh, it can vary in other languages, but that's how we write it in Python.